so after the celebration of the birth of Jesus at Christmas and the visit of the Magi or wise men or the three kings at Epiphany, uh, the story fast forwards about 30 years or so to when Jesus comes to John the Baptist in the wilderness. So during Advent, there were a lot of uh, readings that talked about John's ministry and the word that came to him in the wilderness. Do y'all remember those stories? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do y'all remember how in a world full of big, important people like Tiberius Caesar, the emperor of the greatest empire the world had ever seen, and King Herod Antipas, the king of Galilee, and of people like Annas and Caiaphas, who said in the most senior and the most revered clergy in the temple in Jerusalem that the word of God came to John, the son of nobody, in the wilderness. Do you recall that that prophet then went about in the wilderness and up and down the river Jordan preaching the word that came to him? Do you all recall that crowds desiring repentance and baptism came to him and that he commanded them that they be generous to an astonishing degree? He had the audacity to say to tax collectors and soldiers that they stop being corrupt and just do what they were supposed to do instead of taking things that were not theirs, that they practice justice and compassion. Do you recall that he clarified for those whom he baptized that it was not he who was the greatest messenger or prophet or savior sent from God, but that someone more important than him was coming. Do y'all remember all that from those readings? I thought so. I knew you paid attention. If you remember all of that, then you know that you are ready for today's reading. And if you weren't paying attention during Advent, then you are definitely caught up. I just gave you the cliff notes. <laughs> Now, one might think that the high point in one's ministry would be the point uh, where they have the most followers, or at least the most dedicated followers. And one might think that the glory of a minister of God is widespread praise of their own name or the immense popularity of their own message. But that's not actually true. And it's especially not true for someone like John the Baptist. The high point of his life and ministry is the same for anybody's life, high point of their life and ministry, of the work of, that God is calling them to do. It's not their own coming or the, their own success or their, their own popularity. It's the appearing of another. It's the appearing of Jesus Christ. This other to whom John gave all deference and respect, of whom the prophet himself said he was unworthy to untie his shoes. You see, John's ministry pointed not to himself, but to Jesus, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the Word incarnate, Jesus the wisdom and the reason and the compassion and the love of God, living, breathing, and walking among us in our own human flesh. Jesus the Savior and Redeemer of the world. That was the point of John's ministry. That was the point of his every sermon. That was the point of his every act. That is the point of every sermon, act, and ministry of every Christian minister that has ever existed, at least every good one. <laughs> now, when Jesus does show up, this tells us some valuable things about John's message, and it tells us some important things about Jesus himself, too. Firstly, in today's reading, we see that John the Baptist uh, is going about preaching and inspiring people. His job is to preach the word of God and baptize people. The people are filled with expectation. Now often in Bible times we, we get images of folks missing the point. For generation upon generation upon generation, God has been inspiring a word among us in the church and we seem to uh, be hearing but not listening very well or at least getting confused. And I won't say things like closed-mindedness or selective hearing or gossip have anything to do with that since it's not mentioned today in scripture, but I won't say it doesn't have anything to do with it either. <laughs> the people uh, were a little turned around and wondered whether John 
was himself the Messiah, the anointed one, whether he was the one whose coming God promised and whose coming would open new doors to God. And John's response was to clarify again that he was not the one whom God was sending. He wasn't the one whose coming was heralded by angels and shepherds and whose birth inspired wise men, people with foreign manners and languages and customs to venture abroad in times that were dangerous for travel in order to give him sacred gifts. No, that person was yet to appear at the Jordan. And as great as John was, he wasn't even worthy to untie the true Messiah's shoes. Then John tells us that when the Messiah comes, he's going to do a little sorting. He's going to look around at the harvest, at the crop, at what people's lives had yielded in their actions. Do you all recall what I said John's message was to the crowds before? Be generous and be just. Well, those actions, those seeds which we sow in our own hearts are about to be made known. They are about to be sorted. The one who is our great example is coming and he will be able to tell the true harvest from the rubbish and he will help us purify ourselves. In one place in the Gospels it says he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. That is, there is no sin or transgression, no falling down or impurity, no major mess up in life that the grace of Jesus Christ, that baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit cannot purge away and make good again for sowing better seeds. That fire isn't so much a warning of hell as it is the promise of the hope of heaven, a sign that we don't have to be fields of overgrown weeds. Now, after this, even more people come to be baptized. And not long after that, Jesus himself comes to be baptized. His coming tells us something about John the Baptist. It tells us that John's prophecies and his message are true. By showing up, Jesus validates John. John is neither a false prophet nor a misguided preacher. John is the real deal. Once Jesus appears, he is baptized. And this tells us more about Jesus than John. John stated he wasn't worthy even to bend down and help Jesus untie his shoes. But when the Messiah appears, he doesn't demand help getting the shoes off of his feet. He doesn't show up and demand that the crowds bow down to him and worship him. He goes to John and is baptized. The one who is not worthy to untie Jesus' shoes is given the great honor of baptizing him. In this way, Jesus shows us that his way is one of humility and love. And if you're going to follow Jesus and if you're going to lead in his name, you must do it with grace and humility, with respect and honor for others and for their work. And that doesn't mean don't lead or don't make tough decisions. It means that we have to do everything out of respect for others. And the grace of baptism helps us do this. Spiritual nourishment at the communion table helps us do this too. It's worth mentioning here that John isn't washing away any sins from Jesus because Jesus didn't have any sins to be washed away. Instead, this is Jesus appearing and showing us a model for living, appearing to confirm for us the truth of John's message and the importance of baptism for those who wish to live in the new covenant. And after this, we see another agent at work here. First, we see the incarnate one, Jesus, God the Son walking among us and being baptized by a mere mortal. And after this sacred moment, Jesus prays. And at this start of new life after baptism of prayer, staying connected to God and to others, as he prays, the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove from the open heavens. And this tells us something about baptism, that it opens up a new door for us with God. It opens the gates of heaven in a new way. And I'm not saying that there's no hope for the unbaptized. Don't get me wrong now. There's hope for everyone. What I'm, what I'm saying is that baptism unlocks a new and open relationship with God and with our ultimate salvation. And the Holy Spirit descending 
is a way of God the Father who speaks from heaven to praise God the Son and tells us that Jesus is, in fact, the real deal too. Jesus legitimizes John, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us know that both John and Jesus are doing holy work in this baptism. We are to be baptized as Jesus himself was baptized. We are to share in his death, yes, and we are also to share in his new life, the life of Christ, the risen Lord, who broke the powers of sin and death and who prepares a way for us to have a perfect relationship with God in heaven. And when we are baptized, it's much like the scene here in the gospel. A mere mortal called by God to preach the word takes the sacred water and washes the one who comes forward. But it's really God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who do all the work. When people are baptized, we watch a miracle taking place before our very eyes. A person made in the image of God, whether they are one day old or a hundred years old, is brought into the body of Christ. And through that moment, heaven and earth kiss and become one before our very eyes within that person. You see a person renewed, reborn, made well, made better, infused with grace and power as a way to handle everything that life has to throw at them as a way to handle even death itself. If they haven't been baptized already, all are welcome to come and be washed no matter their past. Because baptism isn't about the past, it's about the future. Baptism is about saying yes to God now and taking that next step into new life. Baptism is not for perfect people. Baptism is for broken people. And in that way, baptism is for everyone. Amen. It's about looking to the Holy Trinity and saying that you want to love and worship God. Or that you want your children to be part of the family of Christ in a similar way. Baptism is a beautiful gift. It's ordained by God and administered by the church, given so that the heavens may open up for us and so that we may see clearly, so that we may live more fully into the good creation God intended for us to be and not the often distorted and hurtful human beings we so often become. Baptism is both physical and spiritual. It's, it's both water and fire. It, it washes us clean and it, it, it purges away the weeds in our own soul and makes space so that we can, with God's help, begin planting and nurturing seeds of grace. And we need all the help we can get. And we need that help from day one. Jesus sets an example here for baptism. And that's what we celebrate today. That's why we baptize people. And we give thanks to God for such graces, both outward and physical and inward and spiritual. And I pray that we carry on this ministry until Jesus comes again in his fullness. Amen. Amen.